Hi, welcome to Nuts and Bolts of New Ventures, session two. Uh, for those of you who were not here last night, I'm Joe Hedzima, and I'm the uh, guide for this uh, tour of New Ventures. And both for, for you who did not come last night and to give our speakers context, uh, we talked last night, we had an introduction to New Ventures where I went around and, and looked at the various things you need to know about in, in thinking about a new venture. And looking back over all the years, the sort of two themes we're going to talk about, one is creating value, and the second is capturing some or all of that value so you can do it again. The second part of last night, Bob Jones talked a lot about creating value with customers, and I, that was a pretty good discussion got, that we had on that. And tonight we come to the second part, which is capturing value, and that part is uh, business models. And we have uh, to walk us through that part of the new venture uh, area is Rich Kibble. Uh, Rich uh, has one of our highly paid uh, volunteers. Uh, we tripled your, your income this year on this. Exactly. That's double. good. Double? double? Oh, okay, well, okay, just double. He only wants double this year. Um, Rich um, has been a serial entrepreneur and investor. He was uh, global chair of the MIT Enterprise Forum after my, I served in that capacity. And he's done this uh, business model course um, several times. So without further ado, and I'll let you say anything else you'd like to do in ways of introduction, because I'm not sure exactly what you're doing these days. <laughs> All right, so Rich, Joe. thank Think you so much. Right. For it. Good. Thank you, everyone. And uh, it's, it's really awesome to be back here. I've uh, had the privilege of doing this class with Joe. Well, let's just say Google didn't exist when we started doing this class together, and he was doing it way before I was. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, again, my name is Rich. Um, my background is very much on the entrepreneurship side and have served as a judge for like, the MIT business plan competition back in the days when it was the MIT 50K entrepreneurship competition, and then, of course, the 100K. And uh, I started, my background is really in the tech side. So I started my career in uh, software, databases, networks, uh, some of you might recall but way back in the days of Unix and NT and Mac and Novell and integration of multiple platforms. Uh, and then I moved into the area of, of biotech, essentially, but not really hard biotech, like you would find, let's say, over at the Broad Institute, uh, but much more informatic biotech. Uh, my first step into that space was uh, I was brought in by the investors as CEO of a MIT spin out called MolecularWare, which was in the informatics space and was actually the, uh, one of the top uh, companies in the 50K competition uh, about a year or two before I joined. And uh, that was sort of my first baby step into the world of life science and healthcare. Uh, it was essentially software, which I knew really well, um, for scientists. And uh, we were doing some things back then that that were kind of revolutionary at, the, at that time, which would be comical at this point. Uh, this is before cloud computing and big data was called big data. What we were doing essentially is we were taking uh, massive amounts of data that was coming off these new genomic instruments, right? Pin tool robots and microarrayers and others. We worked with a group here called the Whitehead Institute. And essentially, they were tracking all that information on spreadsheets. And what we did is we created a, a really fantastic user interface and we somehow created a whole bunch of uh, mechanisms in order for each of the instruments or each of the robots and scanners in that laboratory environment to talk to each other. And because of that, the company did quite well. Um, because in the old days, essentially when, let's say, one company like Applied Precision would sell a scanner and then uh, uh, Biorobotics would sell a pin tool robot to move samples from one point to another, and then another company like Honeywell would sell like a refrigerator that had a barcode scanner. Every one of those things came with its own computer. They didn't talk to each other. So our team wrote all of the mechanisms and languages allowing them to talk to each other. And it became sort of a, what was called a laboratory information management system or a LIM system as they call it now. So that was sort of my baby step into, into the area of healthcare. And uh, then I just sort of decided that I wanted to stay exactly in that space where there was a convergence, where you had ultimately very, very complex data analytics, information, and also human health and research and discovery. Uh, so sort of fast forward a few years, we had sold MolecularWare, uh, and then I had moved out to London 
uh, for uh, about three and a half years uh, to run a genetic diagnostics company. And then had done a series of other uh, activities like that. Uh, but all of them in that area of convergence. And it's, it's something that I really love, where you're actually taking you know, really complicated information, in this case, in many cases, sort of genomic and genetic information, and you're combining it with, with fantastic tools in order to have better insights into human health or into research or a lot of other fields. Um, and then you fast forward, I started doing a few private investments in companies and then serving on boards, and now I run a venture fund uh, called Graybella Capital. And Graybella is actually a European venture fund. Uh, we invest in companies that are uh, not right out of universities, uh, but really a step or two after. So we come in at really Series A, Series B investments, so like expansion capital, uh, investing about three to 10 million euros uh, per company over the life of the company. Uh, so these companies have typically had a proof of concept. They've spun out of a university. In fact, one of our companies, uh, a fantastic organization uh, com called CN Bio, uh, it's, it's based right now in Cambridge, UK, uh, and the technology came out of MIT. Uh, so it's, it's a great example of sort of MIT technology being used in an international environment. Uh, this technology actually is in this very cool field that I, I still struggle to understand no matter how many times they explain it to me. It's called organ on a chip. So if you can imagine, as opposed to doing animal trials, you're actually testing your drug or drug-drug combinations on a human heart, a human liver, a human brain, blood, et cetera, but you're doing it in a microchip environment. That's powerful. Think about how fast that could speed up clinical trials. It could actually change the way we think about bringing drugs to market. Maybe drugs won't take 10 or 12 years to get to market. Maybe it'll take a lot less time because of companies like CN Bio and some of their competitors that are out there. Uh, it came out of Linda Griffith's lab uh, here at MIT, and that company is absolutely accelerating. And, and I mention this one particularly because as we talk tonight about business models, this is something companies like this wrestle with all the time. Like, hey, we've got this cool technology. You know, it's the next anti-gravity machine. You know, it's the next Uber. It's the next whatever. How on earth do we actually make money? You know, do we sell this directly to consumers? Do we just you know, uh, go to distributors around the world that ultimately will solve the sales and marketing problem for us, or so we hope? Do we sell online? So each of these things are really important decisions. And when I work with companies now as a board member or investor, these are the things that each of my CEOs and management teams face every day is we tried this, it didn't work, what should we try next? Our competitor is going to market with these particular strategies, should we copy that? Should we just double down, go to twice as many conferences, spend twice as much on Facebook ads, twice as much on marketing, or do we take an entirely different approach? So I shared ba my background just so you have a little bit of familiarity that I I've been in that seat where it's sort of like, gosh, struggling, Number one, do I want to do a business or should I join this early stage company? And number two, what's the chances of success? And what are the key things that are going to increase the probability of success while I'm on this journey? And I view every company that you are part of, whether you're an advisor, an investor, or you're actually part of that founding team, as a journey. It really is. Uh, sometimes that'll become the incredible unicorn or other times it might become an absolute flaming disaster and just like crash into the side of the mountain and you have to wipe yourself off and go, wow, what did I learn? What would I do differently? And let's try this again. There's a fantastic story today in Business Insider. I don't know if you guys read that, BI. Uh, it's one of my favorite apps. Uh, it is about, everybody knows Uber just went public, right? Cute little company, interesting idea. Felt like I could have thought of that. How hard would that have been? A uh, bunch of cars driving around picking up people. Uh, however, they just went public. And uh, who rang the bell at the public offering? Anybody know? Travis actually wasn't allowed on the platform. He was in the audience with his dad. Not the CEO. The fourth employee of Uber rang the bell. It's a fantastic woman. I recommend you Google the hell out of this. Fourth employee 
of Uber. She joined there as an intern. And she just spoke at World's Most Powerful Women in Technology Conference a few years ago at the age of 30. So think about that. She went in there literally begging for a job, created this crazy ass PowerPoint presentation to sell herself and it had humor involved and it had a whole bunch of interesting things. But she just knew like, I wanna try this startup thing. I have no idea what these guys are doing, but it sounds cool and is now ringing the bell for Uber, one of the largest IPOs in the world. So if you think about that, sometimes you don't need to found the company. You don't need to be the CEO. I mean, titles are cheap. We can all make business cards tomorrow with CEO written on them. Sometimes just aligning yourself with a company that has some vision, passion, and you feel you can contribute, it's an amazing journey. So for those of you, and I know most of this class, um, this is session two, I guess, of like six or seven sessions. And many of you are thinking about how do I, how do I start my own company or how do I join a company? And many of you are also considering, of course, the MIT Entrepreneurship Competition, which is literally the leading platform in the world for startups and spin outs. So I encourage you, if you haven't already found one, align yourself with a company, even if it's just in a small role, and go on that journey. One of the key things you're gonna think about is business models. So uh, today I don't wanna do a big, long, blah, 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 40 slides, et cetera, so feel free to raise your hand, interrupt. Uh, we'll have a point for Q&A at the end, of course, but you know, I'd like this to be a little bit of a two-way dialogue. So, how do you think about business models? Um, you know, there's a lot of definitions out there. This is probably the most simple one out there. I certainly believe it. It's a method by which a firm uses its resources, whether it be their cash, their technology, their people, to offer customers better value than the competitors and hopefully make money doing it. Or, in many cases, lose money doing it, but with a bigger vision in mind. Many of the companies we know Amazon included, lost money for a very long period of time. And it's just because they measured success differently. The success wasn't necessarily on the margin or the profits. The success might have been on number of users, owning a marketplace, et cetera. And we'll talk about that because that's an important piece of the business model. Uh, so sort of thinking about how companies are built, uh, the beauty of being here at MIT uh, versus, let's say, anywhere else in the world, uh, or even other universities I speak at, which are mostly in Europe, um, MIT has the power to go through the entire pyramid. If you're just at a general business school somewhere, you're probably at the much higher level of the pyramid, you're bumping into a company that's spun out of a hospital or a university, but here you can actually see companies growing from literally the foundation where there is just R&D happening. You know, it's happening over in Linda's lab or it's happening at the Koch Institute or the MIT Broad or it's happening just in the engineering department and somebody's doing something super cool and maybe they got some DARPA funding or NIH, you have no idea if that's gonna become a company. A lot of times it doesn't become a company and actually a lot more times than that, it shouldn't become a company. It should be a product perhaps or a licensing of technology to a company. Some of the best technology out there never came from a company, it came from a university that then did a license to Telefonica or Intel and that then becomes a product that all of us just take for granted. It doesn't have to become a company. And one of your jobs as entrepreneurs is to think about, is this deserving of a company or is this just simply a feature, right? Spell check is pretty impressive, but that sure as hell would not have been a company. But think about it. Many people would have looked at that incredible feature, the power to actually Look at all different spellings, different languages, underline it, allow you to right click, boom, correct changes. I mean, that could have been a company, but it actually just became a feature. So if you think about when you see some whiz bang technology, the next greatest thing that pretty much everybody in the lab would probably buy, think about is there a market beyond that? Because one of the great failures in the world of research is that people spend a lot of time convincing themselves that what they have will change the world, but they don't talk to the world. So before you get overly excited about creating a spin out out of some lab or some university uh, system, think about to yourself like, all right, who would we sell to first and then go knock on their doors and talk to them? And that will give you then even more courage to go out there and move up this value chain and move up this pyramid and start to think about the business model. So the R&D, the proof of concepts, all of those things are the foundation. 
And then as you grow, ultimately, especially if you take outside capital, you're looking for an exit. Technology companies are not normally ever family businesses. Manufacturing is a great family business. Shipping, distribution, retail can be, certainly in the food and beverage industry. But when you're thinking about technology because of the speed of technological change, it's rare that it can actually be a company where it just grows organically, run by a bunch of great people that all love each other and they take the profits and they share it between putting it into more R&D uh, and into their own pockets. Um, so very often you're forced to take outside capital. And if you're gonna take outside capital, one of the first thing those investors are gonna wanna know is what is your business plan, model, and how are you thinking about exiting? So think about this pyramid from a standpoint of where are you entering the company? You might be at the R&D level, which is still what I consider the very foundational levels, or you might be entering a company that's already got market validation. It's got a strong management team. It's a profitable business model. It doesn't mean that that business model will continue to exist. We can look at a lot of great case studies. We can look at Blockbuster, and we can look at Netflix. The business model of both of those companies changed over time, one a lot better and faster than the other. One of those companies still exists today and the other one doesn't. So think about when you're evaluating a company, you've met a bunch of great people that are starting something, where are they in this cycle? And where can you contribute the most? And most importantly, what is their business model and are they adaptable to change? So why do companies fail? It's sort of a, I guess an age old story, you can go down the street to the Sloan School and I think this is an entire class. But the number one reason that companies fail is a lack of understanding of the market. It's not cash, isn't that crazy? I always believed that, well companies fail because they ran out of money. Like, I mean shit, if I still can pay the bills and I can pay my staff and I'm sitting on you know, 12 months, 18 months worth of capital, we haven't failed. But if you actually read the business news, company after company goes out of business and actually does so with cash in the bank. In fact, public companies sometimes just close their doors and return the capital to uh, the market or they become a shell with capital and somebody might do a reverse into that shell. But, but capital is not the main reason that businesses fail. A company that has no market need may not be succeeding because the market doesn't want their product. They just don't have a clue on how to get the market to accept and embrace their product. Number one reason, no market need, which can be determined, or I should say can be translated into, didn't understand the market, didn't know how to communicate with the market, didn't actually figure out who its customers were, some of the business models that we'll talk about uh, during our session today is, is really how companies have differentiated themselves. Right? Think about things that we take for granted all of the time. Clothing, as an example. There are clothing companies, very fantastic designers. They are lauded by the greatest of all that are out there, and ultimately their brand fails. Why is that? How is it that they completely failed? I mean, why is it that brands that we were wearing 10, 15 years ago are now gone, but other brands like Polo, Ralph Lauren's brands, which is multiple brands, just continue to dominate? Part of the reason is they figured out the market. They knew their business model. They realized that they wanted to attack the market at different levels. So you can walk into a Marshalls today and you can buy Polo Sport the lowest brand that they have, which is phenomenal, quality, great, and it has the polo label on it. Or you could buy their next level, polo by Ralph Lauren with the little horse. You could then buy the next level up from there, which is getting into the brand called Lauren. Then you can buy the next level up from there that's called Black Label, which is <laughs> Ralph Lauren's couture model that he'll, send a, he'll sell a dress for $25,000. How is that? Think about the power of that. They've created a business model that has touched every aspect of sort of socioeconomic class, but everybody feels good they're walking around with something that's polo. 
Other brands just don't figure that out. And ultimately, boom, they close their doors. And you think to yourself, wow, what happened to that company? Like, geez, that used to be so popular. You know, that's a great example of where no market need. They just couldn't figure it out. Think about the electronics that you use. The electronics you use, we all take for granted, right? Some of you guys are running around with Dell computers, PCs that are, I can see an HP, uh, I can see a couple of HPs, I see another Apple, some people have Dell. Each of those companies took an entirely different approach, maybe not entirely, but a pretty damn different approach to selling computers. Dell was the first to say, you know what? This whole idea that we've got to create a gazillion computers and ship them out to big box retailers, stock their shelves with, with gazillions of inventory, and hope people pick that one off the shelf is just stupid. We're going to build it online. So you get to pick the server you, you know, excuse me, you get to pick the speed you want for the processor, you get to pick the screen size you want. Gateway did similar things. So they chose a business model that was different, let's say, than the Apple business model. Think about it. Apple a few years ago, there was no such thing as an Apple store. You bought Apple at apple.com. You bought Apple in some retailers, but it was very rare to actually see an entire store dedicated to just one type of computer company. Right? You would go into Best Buy, maybe, and you could pick up an HP computer there, but it would seem weird right now if HP created the HP stores on Boylston Street. It would just seem totally wacky. You'd be like, that seems so strange. They're just copying Apple. Apple was able to do it, but they were only able to do that because they recognized that they had already built such a brand and loyalty that they could get people to actually spend time in their retail stores, kind of the way Starbucks did. So you weren't just running into Best Buy, grabbing that Dell computer off, going to the register, checking out. You were actually spending time there. You were learning. You were perhaps going back and taking classes. All of the things I'm describing are related to the business model. And many companies fail very, very quickly and succeed just because they misstepped there. So let's talk about some things. In 2019, if you can imagine this, 553 startups that raised over 1.9 billion in capital, and this is a tiny snapshot, and many of them you probably have not even heard of, just disappeared. Can you imagine that? It goes to the point of the earlier slide as well. I mean, you've got companies like Anki. It's incredible. They raised 182 million frickin' dollars. I mean, that's just wacky. 182 million. They no longer exist. Why is that? So they were founded. Carnegie Mellon Robotics people, fantastic team. Basically, according to its long-term roadmap, they could no longer continue being a hardware software business. I know a lot of hardware software businesses that are succeeding. They couldn't figure out their business model. They tore through 182, just a mind-boggling amount of capital. Just to figure out their business model wasn't working. Think about that. Take a look at other companies. This one up here, uh, actually, uh, there's one called Oryx Vision up here. This company raised $67 million. Working in a space that Seems like a really cool space to work in, autonomous vehicle visioning. Hottest space probably out there right now. Think about that. Great technology, phenomenal sensors, tremendous performance, all about autonomous markets. Ultimately, they couldn't figure out who the hell they were selling to. They had contracts they were trying to do with the military. They were trying to attack GM, Ford, Chrysler. They were trying to go after Tesla. They were trying to do all sorts of things. That lack of focus on the business model allowed them to tear through $67 million. Layer, another one there, $45 million disappeared. This was a scalable open cloud service for communications for large carriers, all voice over IP. This company could have absolutely been competing directly against Skype, WhatsApp voice, killed it. Tens of millions of dollars, poof, gone. That was the end of it, right off. Did not fail because they had a lack of money. They failed because of their business plan and their business model. So your business model is not the business itself, but it's the most important piece. They're innovative, critical, developmental things. The quality of your business is all about attacking new markets and driving profitability and having that flexibility in order to change. But you have to change super fast. 
the worst thing I see in companies that we either invest in or even partner with is that they recognize a problem. We talk about it in the February board meeting. And then we go back again. In 60 days, we have another board meeting. And they're talking about the same damn problem. And they made like a tiny tweak. And then 60, 90 days later, we have another board meeting. And they're still talking about the problem. But now they have a plan. You think to yourself, you, did, you just burnt through six months of capital and didn't change your plan. So for those people that emphasize, and this is very common at wonderful places like MIT, that emphasize the technology is going to cause us to win. It's not the technology. You go back to that list of the top reasons businesses fail, it's rarely because the technology just didn't work. So think about that. These are the key ingredients that I often th think are part of the business model. So if we get started to drill down in the business model itself, it's like, what is your value proposition? Obviously those companies, many of them have flamed out. People just didn't understand the value proposition. What is your market segment? Who are you actually targeting? Where do you fit within that value chain? The value chain being essentially, where are you most important? You can't be all things to all people. Many of you are sitting there with laptops right now. There's probably a little tiny sticker on that laptop that says Intel inside. Anybody here ever been in the Intel store? Probably not, right? Because they understood early on where exactly they fit within the value chain. They knew, we're not, we're not selling to consumers. We're not gonna start doing like memory devices and selling them at Best Buy. We're not gonna open a store next to Apple and be like, cool, the Intel in inside store. They said, this is crazy. We're just going to build the world's best processors, different levels, different versions, different sizes, and we're going to partner with the world's biggest computer companies. They're gonna do all the work for us. And we're gonna be this cute little sticker on the front, Intel inside. It's one of the most successful companies in the world, formerly run by one of the most successful business people in the world, Andy Grove. Andy Grove built that business from the earliest stages through, and honestly, the reason he figured it out, he said, I've got no ego in this. My goal is to bring the greatest technology to the most amount of people, and no one needs to know who I am. That's an entirely different vision than Apple which was, I'm gonna bring the greatest technology to the most amount of people and everyone's gonna join the Apple cult. They're gonna know who we are, who I am, et cetera, right? And there's nothing wrong with either vision, but the company that lacks clarity and doesn't really figure out where they fit within that value chain are the ones that get crushed. Uh, position within the market, revenue generation margins, all those things that you need to measure, your competitive strategy, and where you are in the stage, remember the pyramid? Where are you in your stage of development in the market? These are all things like the management team need to sit down and talk, with, talk about every day because they change. You could wind up finding yourself at a conference and all of a sudden you realize, holy shit, there's two other competitors that just popped up out of nowhere. Let's go back to where we started. Are we targeting the right market segment? Where do we sit within this value chain and this network? How are we thinking about our stage of development? Are we actually as far along as we thought we were? These guys just raised more money. They're getting all over the map. They're at every conference. Do we compete with them head to head? Do we try to outprice them? That's a business model decision, right? Do we go lower and just try to outprice the hell out of them? Or do we take an entirely different approach? We attack a part of the market that perhaps they're not in. Each of these have a tremendous impact on the success of the companies. So just to talk about a few of these, I'm gonna zip through these slides quickly. That way we have time for questions and, and, and a few case studies. When you think about the value proposition, these are the key drivers, which is a description of the customer's problem, right? What am I trying to solve? What is the solution that we actually are creating that, that addresses that problem? And then sort of what is the value of the solution from the customer's perspective, right? So if I think about the value and the solution, essentially I have to understand that the customer reads that. The customer understands. If I decided today I wanted to create a new watch company, Right? Some people still wear watches. Most people are now just looking at their phone at what time it is. But if I wanted to create a new watch company, right, could be generally pretty low tech. I need to understand where I fit from a value proposition perspective. Am I going to create this handmade instrument with Swiss timing? 
that takes 18 months from development, from beginning to end, and sell it for 50 or 60,000, like Paddock Phillip or IWC or some of the leading watch companies? Or am I gonna create the biggest competitor to Swatch? Where literally I have retailers everywhere. You can pick up a watch from $29.99 up to $299. They're cool, they're colorful, you can change the bands. Like, they're both watch companies. Don't get me wrong. These aren't computer companies. They still have arms going around. They both do the same thing. Where do you fit within that value proposition? One of the coolest companies I've seen out there recently in, the, in, in that sector, by the way, how, how many people here have heard of Shinola? I worked at Shinola once. <laughs> All right, you are in trouble, man. Oh, no. you, you took a front row seat and you had like the best answer <laughs> and I did not pay you for that. Why does Shinola matter? I mean, what, what do they do? Just to, for those that don't know in here, wh what the hell is a Shinola? So Shinola started um, as a manufacturing company that uh, made, set out to revitalize manufacturing jobs in Detroit. And they make high-end and uh, sort of everything is, is a head nod to like mid-century um, like technologies or style, uh, like the classics. And so they made watches, bikes, leather goods, And they make, as you said, watches, right? Yeah. All, all American made timepieces. You can go into the Prudential Center now. If you go up in the Prudential, you know where the Tesla dealer is? We'll talk about Tesla later. On Boylston Street, you go up that escalator, just walk straight. When you get in that little rotunda, Shinola has this awesome store there. Then you yourself, like, who's gonna start a watch company in 2020? I mean, shit, I have two kids. Like, neither of them even own a watch. I mean, they look at their phone, right? Think about what they did. Like Shinola, they basically took a model, which was watchmaking, and they said, you know what? We're going to do something special here. Think about the message they're sending. These are, these are art, you know, basically pieces of art that are made to look like they were built in the 60s and 50s, right? I mean, these things are elegant, beautiful watches. They're not big watches with like diamonds and gold crap all over them. They're like leather bands in most cases, beautiful face, very subtle, elegant, the kind of watch you could wear with a suit or you could literally wear to the beach. And American made. And Detroit. Like, they're checking like every box, right? It's kind of like, from a marketing perspective, it's like, holy shit, like this is Detroit made. Detroit used to make great things, right? Cars, you had all these amazing engineers that understand manufacturing and steel and all of these things. They were able to build this brand called Shinola, which is probably, I think, one of the fastest growing watch companies out there. But they did something magical, which is they did not try to compete against anyone. They weren't trying to compete against Swatch and build like your next cool plastic watch. And they weren't trying to create a, compete against Rolex, which is glitzy and golds and silvers and sponsoring sailboat races around the world. They weren't trying to do that. They said, no, no, no. We're going to do something special here. And correct me if I'm wrong, I think they started online only, right? Yeah, and then they opened up their, mini, their store in Detroit the first time in 2012 or 2013. Amazing. And now you see them everywhere. So think about that. I mean, that is a thoughtful management team. I mean, they, they determined where they fit, what their value proposition is. They knew exactly what market segment they were targeting, right? They were not targeting the 19-year-old that wants to buy his girlfriend a watch. And they weren't targeting the super wealthy that collect watches. They knew their market segment. They knew where they fit within the value chain, right? So they understood how that firm is gonna capture the value within that entire process, right? Were they gonna become the manufacturer, the retailer? Were they gonna become the sales and marketing group? They understood where they wanted to fit. And ultimately, they continued to grow and generate tremendous revenue and margins. And now, as you said, which is wonderful, is that they, they now have a name that's growing. They now have leather goods and products and bags, and it's just sort of this cachet around Shinola. And you think about it, like, who would have thought of this in 2010? You know, here we are a decade later, and these guys are growing like gangbusters, and they're in major Class A uh, locations throughout New York, Boston, and others. I mean, they're not just like a little retailer selling online. So 
that's a phenomenal way of saying, if you think through your business model and each of these components we just shared here, each of these, you can truly have a differentiated product. And then once you have sustainability, you then have the power to expand, right? So many companies say to me, well, geez, you know, but what about like Netflix? Like they're in everything, right? I mean, shit, they produce movies, they da, da, da. It's like, dude, it's like, yeah. They're a multi-billion dollar company with more money in the bank than the GDP of the average small country. That's not where they started. They started as a head-to-head -head competitor against Blockbuster. Who in here even remembers Blockbuster? I, I got to stop using that story, uh, Joe. I'm like so freaking old now that I remember going to the Blockbuster and being like disappointed, like, oh shit, they didn't have that movie I wanted. And like, okay, I'll find something else. And then I had to like rush back. You guys are all looking at me like I'm insane. Um, you literally like, you got the movie, right? You paid your whatever. And you needed to get that movie back within like a certain amount of time. And even though the Blockbuster was closed, they had like a little barcode scanner attached to this mailbox. And you would go up and you'd put the movie into the little slot. You know, it'd be like Saturday at 7 a.m. They're not open yet, but holy shit, this has to be back by noon. You'd put it in the box and you were safe. And if you didn't put it in the box, you got charged a late fee. It was absolutely brutal. And then they would call you, they would charge your credit card. And that's how you rented movies back then. It didn't matter whether it was on DVD or it was back in the VCR days. Blockbuster was it. I mean, they were the market player. And then Netflix said, this is dumb. Like, these guys are not even a, they're not even a movie video shop anymore. They're a real estate company. They had thousands of locations all over. Think about the cost. Shelves and shelves and shelves of videotapes. Netflix says, well, this is dumb as ass. I mean, we're just going to basically not sell out the whole box. We're just going to send you the little DVD in the mail. So you go on to your really slow dial-up modem or your very slow internet connection. You go to this thing called Netflix. You'd say, okay, good. I want you know, Top Gun, and I want this and this. And they'd let you keep it for a week. They didn't care. They would send it to you in an envelope. No bulk, nothing. Bang. It was there within a day or two. You could have a week's worth of movies at your house. It was a phenomenal, it, it literally completely crushed Blockbuster. It was a simple model. They knew in the value chain, like, this is easy. The reason Blockbuster is failing is because they've got a billion dollars in leases of real estate throughout the United States. And a whole ton of employees that are standing there at the register, and they have to keep inventory. These guys basically had nothing but a warehouse with DVDs. So think about that power. They completely changed the industry. Now we look at Netflix and it's, you know, it's competing with MGM and, and all of the major movie houses. It's competing with HBO. It's, it's an absolute mega machine. But that's not how they started. So let's continue uh, to get into a few other things. Let's look at some of the models that are changing. I would imagine you guys are familiar with most of these companies. They've been around for a while. Who can help me here? So if you take a look at any one of these, Snapchat. I still don't understand Snapchat. Um, <laughs> as of a few years ago, market cap of 34 billion. Somebody can actually uh, figure out for me where they are now. They might be a fraction of that. They went down to like 17. But Snapchat, what a crazy model, right? Like I, I first heard about this. I said, this is the most silly thing I've ever heard in my life. Like I send somebody something and it disappears. Like it's, I just don't quite get that. I can delete things. I didn't need like an app to do that for me. And then my kids explain to me why that works so well. Um, great way to hide shit from your parents. Um, so Snapchat <laughs> was great for that, right? Can't imagine what those pictures were. Uh, but they're gone, right? Holy. Snapchat completely created a new way to communicate that was like old fashioned to many of us. I mean, it's old fashioned to many of you now, but for many of us, it was just completely bizarre. We're used to sending a text or an email and then Snapchat came along, completely reinvented sort of the way people communicate. Uh, think about Dropbox. I, I, I probably don't go a day in my life without using Dropbox. Somebody here tell me, who uses Dropbox, by the way? <laughs> That's crazy. All right, so like two thirds of you use Dropbox. Why does Dropbox work? What is the value of Dropbox? What do you think? It's what? It's easy, right? 
What's the other value of Dropbox? Exactly. It's access, it's sharing, it's secure. I mean, that's pretty cool. If you thought about it years ago, the reason Dropbox might work is because storage space was really expensive, right? Really expensive. Like, you had to pay a lot of money to store stuff. You, you posted photos. You had to store them. You had to pay for it. You had to buy a computer with more memory. So the concept of Dropbox was simply around the fact that they were able to remove the stress of storage from the end user and store it in this thing called the cloud. And then they got really good at what they did. And now government agencies, hospitals, major, major organizations use Dropbox because they not only provide like free storage, right? Not that any of us is running out of storage. We have more storage on our phones than literally people had in major big ass computers 15 years ago. I mean, how many of us have like thousands of photos? Before, it took forever just to email five photos to somebody. And now you can have 3,000 on your phone and it's not even coming close to slowing down your phone. So it isn't actually that their business model is about saving your storage space. They've created a model that essentially makes them indispensable to businesses and individuals that need to store or share lots of data. Hospitals that we worked with, they use Dropbox to share imaging. That is amazing because these images sometimes are so big, there's absolutely no way you could share them over an email. So Dropbox is a fantastic story of they took the wave of new technology that was growing. They were taking, the, taking advantage of cheaper and cheaper storage, <laughs> faster and faster internet, the ability to actually upload and download stuff super fast. And then they continued to add more benefits. So their business model continued to change. In the old days, Dropbox was a free service and basically for all of us. And then they went after the small to medium-sized business. Then they went after the large business. Then they started going after government agencies. And all of a sudden, they own the space now. Had they tried to sell their first investors on the idea that they were going to do all of those things, they would have never gotten funding. So their business model was highly focused, but the vision of that CEO and the others that are part of that company drove it. How many people here are familiar with 23andMe? That's an incredible story. What was the 23andMe sort of story in the beginning? Who can tell me, just sort of shout it out. What were they offering, right? What was the 23andMe pitch? Right? Information about you, your family, right? It was just a simple thing. It was Ancestry, right? It's like there's another company, their well, it was their competitor until they left them in the dust called Ancestry.com. So it was kind of this cool thing, hey, you know, with a little prick of blood or with a little bit of an, a mouth swab, we can do this really cheap sequencing. We can then run it against all of these other publicly available databases and ultimately do a little bit of ancestry and find out that you know, even though you grew up believing that you're half Irish and half Italian, you're actually really English and very Scottish and a little bit of Spanish, right? And that was kind of cool. And then what they realized also, think about this, the power of their network. So every time one person did a swipe, they learned more about themselves, but then when 30 other people did a swipe, they started to be able to connect these magical dots and start to see trends start to see migratory patterns, start to see all sorts of connections within individuals. That was a phenomenal model. I mean, that alone is a business. But then the CEO, Ann Wozczecki, she had a bigger vision. She realized that they were going to start to look at disease. They were going to start to look at prediction of health. They were going to start to look at a whole series of other things. And they went through some tough times. I don't know who here remembers like some of the lawsuits and some of the crazy shit that happened with 23andMe. I mean, they were kicked out of New York. They were being sued by attorney generals, sharing patient data or transportation of biological samples without the, I mean, literally, it should have crushed that company. But it didn't. They went, they talked to the FDA, they worked with the regulators, they continued to improve their business model, they raised more capital, and I'm telling you right now, they are on their way to become a pharmaceutical company. And they will become a force to be reckoned with because they have more genetic samples than virtually any other organization anywhere. It's mind-boggling. So what started off as a silly little idea, take a Q-tip, 
send it to our lab, and some period of time we're going to send you a cute little report that, of what, what ancestry you might have, is now turning into one of the most sophisticated data analytics healthcare companies in the world. Absolute dominant player. And their business model has probably changed 15 times. We all know about Uber, great story, Airbnb, who's getting, you know, really getting hit very much, uh, like, like Uber, right, around regulatory and competitors and things of that nature. I mean, when Uber started, it was Uber, right? Now you've got Lyft, you've got a whole bunch of others, ride sharing. When Airbnb started, it was Airbnb. It was just like, they were the total rock stars. They completely disintermediated and, and annoyed the hell out of every hotel company in the world. Airbnb, I, I don't know, somebody here could probably Google it. I used to have the number. I mean, Airbnb controls more beds, more rooms, than like the top five hotel companies in the world combined. And I'm not talking about like hotels like Starwood uh, Just. I'm talking about like entire entities like Bonvoy that now owns all of the Sheridans, the Westons, the Ws, the St. Regis, all of those. Those major ho hotel groups have less beds to put people in than Airbnb like by a factor of 10. It's absolutely mind boggling. Take the top five companies, Airbnb controls more beds. The regulators crush you know, down on them really hard. You know, and now you pay taxes and you pay all these sort of other things uh, because the hotel uh, groups didn't know what to do. They couldn't innovate, right? The hotel companies are like, oh shit. All of a sudden we went from like average 88% occupancy in this particular city, now we're down to 65%. Why? And all of a sudden they realized Airbnb was completely eating their lunch. So they of course then fought, went to, went to uh, like, like all the taxi cab companies did to Uber, they went to the regulators and they went to the government and they said, whoa, whoa, whoa this isn't fair. These guys are selling hotel rooms equivalent and they're not even paying taxes. Neither is the person that's staying there. So you know, they're getting that room for 210 bucks. We're selling a similar room for 210, but we then have to pay you $60 in you know, city tax, state tax, tourist tax, et cetera. So it changed and they survived that. So a lot of that is credit to their business model. But if you think about it, something like an Airbnb totally reinvented an entire industry um, of overnight stay, just as Uber invented transportation. Uh, this isn't meant to read, by the way. Um, but I remember, I, I wish I kept that slide from uh, the last time I did this class. The number was something like two, 205 or something. Somebody could look it up. It's on, on Joe's website. Um, right now, can you imagine there's 393 private companies valued at a billion plus. Like that is just totally retarded. I mean, awesome. I love it. It makes me the happiest person in the world because it just shows how innovation and new technology is changing the world. And you don't have to be a public company in order to actually have tremendous value and create returns for your investors. Um, this is a report uh, that you can look up. It's from CB Insights. So if you just Google it, you put in your email address, you can actually see each of these companies close up. Uh, and this is in all different industry sectors. I mean, you look at this, mobile telecommunications, auto, transport, edutech, health, fintech, internet software and services. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. And 80% of these companies, I guarantee you've never heard of. Because some of them are so specialized, like they're focused in one particular industry sector, like the auto sector. And unless you're in that industry, you have no clue who the hell the players are. But those are the players. It's absolutely incredible. So if you think about this, if you're, if you're gonna start a company, there is no better time in your lifetime to be part of an accelerating growth fast company than now. I mean, literally 100 plus companies have been added to this list just in the past probably 18 months. That's powerful. Now there's a bigger discussion maybe over at the business school around how do the investors get out of here, right? Because if you're at a billion dollar valuation and you're used to actually making your profits when the company goes public, you know, you need a lot more Uber size uh, IPOs. But from a standpoint of wealth creation, impact on society, and taking advantage of technological change and new business models, these companies are absolutely paving the way. So what you measure matters. This is something that I try to tell students in any class that I'm teaching is, if you're not measuring it, it obviously doesn't matter. And if it does matter, you better be able to put numbers around it. It's as simple as that. I don't care what you measure, actually. It's, it's, it's like, if you think it's important in your business, measure it. As an example, one measurement is revenue per employee. That's one way to measure things. So if you think about it, revenue per employee, it's not the same in any industry. 
if I am actually selling large, massive industry size equipment, right? I might have a back office of support and manufacturers, and I might have 10 salespeople, and the average sale is 25 million, right? My revenue per employee might not be that high. Because I have to take into account that employee that did the sale plus the whole back office, right? And none of them are producing sales, but they're creating the technology. Versus, let's say, a software company, but they have a whole bunch of engineers, and now there's no salespeople. People just download it, right? All of a sudden, that revenue for employees is a different number, right? Doesn't necessarily correlate to profit. We're talking about top line revenue. There's a lot of companies out there that have 200 million in revenue, and they're dropping 30% profit to the bottom line. And other companies that have a billion in revenue that are barely scraping by with their profitability because the cost of goods sold is higher. But I, I, I share this as just one example that when you're thinking about your business model, what are we measuring? What is important? Is it revenue per employee? Is it profit? Well, if you're Amazon, profit doesn't matter to you. It was about capturing the market and absolutely owning the space, right? If you're Apple, you happen to have nailed both of them by now, which is revenue per employee and profit, one of the most profitable companies in the entire world. So if you think about this sort of metrics, you have different things you need to measure. And if you are not measuring those, then obviously they're not important to your business, and it better not be a big part of your business model. But if your business model is that you are going to own a particular space, like you're going to become the key player, then you need to think about number of users, number of installs, number of downloads, whatever it is, that needs to be something you measure. And your pricing, your business model, your strategy better be consistent with that. If you're a company that's selling super high-end goods, you know, number of users or acquirers can be very, very low. Right? If you're selling $10 million plus homes, you can't measure your success by the number of units sold. If, however, you become a realtor and you get hired and you're at a place down in Florida that just built you know, 20 different huge apartment complexes that are selling condos, they may measure you on number of units sold. Because they're churning those things left and right. Each building has 85 condos in it. They have 30 buildings. It's units sold, man. Like, let's dump these, sell them as quick as possible so we can build another one. But if you're sitting in Greenwich, Connecticut as a realtor, you're not talking about units sold because last year you might have sold one. It happened to be for $84 million or $12 million. And your profit and your boss's profit was tremendous. But think about that is tremendous measurement importance. You have to be able to say, what is important to us? What's our business model? Is it consistent with the things that we measure? Another good one is this. I love this one. Profit per second. I don't know, I don't know what genius mathematician had too much time on their hand to actually come up with this. Uh, but how cool is that? Literally per second, $1,400. Boom, every second. Boom, 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 Apple. That's profit. That's not revenue. Number of units sold, it's absolute profit. And if you think about also this, it's kind of a crazy thing because if you took a, take a look at the top, the top three companies here, they are so dramatically different. Like you cannot say, oh, all the money is in FinTech. You know, all the money is in hardware, software. All the money is in something else. I mean, you look at Apple, we all know Apple. We don't have to talk about them. JP Morgan Chase. What did they do? Who here has a Chase card? Right? So they have credit cards. What else does JP Morgan Chase do? Anybody else? Investment banking. Investment banking, which means mergers, acquisitions, capital raises, IPOs, right? So they get massive transaction fees off of these things. They sell company A to company B, boom, they get a huge ass fee. They wind up taking a company public for $400 million, they get a really big fee, right? What else do they do? Asset management, right? So they're sitting on tons of money for wealthy individuals and for businesses, right? So if you're sitting, you know, you sell your company for $30 million, you're probably not going to put it in your checking account. You're going to wind up calling up somebody like J.P. Morgan Chase, their wealth management group, and you're going to say, listen, I, I, I need to manage this. Like, I'm a software dude. I, I have no idea whether this should go into stocks or bonds or currencies or real estate. You do it for me. And they get a fee for every piece of that. So here you have this crazy diversified business, 
that has just gazillions of customers that are long-term customers that they just keep earning residual income off of. And then you have Apple, who's created a model where you essentially walk in, you buy a product, and you walk out. And then you join their service, and you have iTunes, and you start to download. So they're, each of them are capturing your revenue, your profit, or their profit from your, your expenses in different ways, but totally different businesses. Berkshire Hathaway is a whole different story. It's a conglomerate of a gazillion companies. They own everything from insurance companies to uh, furniture companies, you name it. We all know, all know them, right? Who, who runs Berkshire Hathaway? Warren Buffett, right? What do they call him? What's his funny name, his nickname? What is it? The Oracle of Omaha. Oracle of Omaha. Where is Facebook on that list? Well, they're kind of uh, not uh, in this case because, <laughs> and this, this list is probably about 18 months old, but honestly, uh, profit per second is not that high. For them. Yeah, not as big as these guys. Alphabet, we all know who that is, right? That's Google, who's in everything. Microsoft, I don't know how they're still on this list, but they are. J and J, I mean, just incredible. They're in everything. They sell everything from drugs to Q-tips to you know five hundred thousand dollar instruments that go into hospitals. So think about what you measure. I'm going to start to close up and uh, leave this to you guys in a few minutes for just questions. Uh, so we can have perhaps, I'll throw this out there as open discussion on a couple of things here. Number one, how Amazon innovates in ways that Google and Apple can't. Amazon is completely, what was Amazon to begin with? Everybody knows this, right? Bookstore. That's it. It's like, hey, why do you have to go into a bookstore to buy a book? You don't have to try it on and make sure it fits. Okay? It's like, you like the book, you read about the book in the New York Times you know, top 10 books of the quarter, and you just go on to our website, and we're gonna ship it to you within three days. You don't have to drive to Barnes & Noble, or what is the other one it used to be? Uh, Borders? Borders, Barnes & Noble, and I think there's even another one, and most of them are gone now. Um, but they've innovated in ways that even Google and Apple have not been able to do, just incredible. I mean, you could literally buy everything from a Ferrari to a chainsaw uh, on Amazon today, and that is just a tiny piece of their business. What's the other big thing they do? What? AWS, right? Absolutely phenomenal. Most people didn't know what the hell AWS was. And now all of a sudden, they are the, I don't know if they're the largest, I don't want to exaggerate, but I, I will say they've got to be one of the biggest out there from the standpoint of web services and cloud services uh, that are out there. You know, um, Here's some others that I thought I'd throw in here that are fantastic case studies. Alibaba, I mean, I think it's got to be one of, the, one of the most valuable companies in the world outside of, I think they are actually, next to the big oil company that just went public in Saudi Aramco. Saudi Aramco is now the, is the most, from the standpoint of valuation in the world, the most valuable company in the entire world is Saudi Aramco. Alibaba's got to be up there in the top few. Uh, Tesla, phenomenal model. Who would have thought like electric cars? It wasn't like he thought of electric cars, right? There'd been electric cars for a long time. There'd been hybrid cars, all those other things. Uh, Zara, who here knows the Zara story? Anybody work at Zara? Shop at Zara? All right, how about shop at Zara? I know some people shop at Zara. All right, what a crazy ass model, right? Zara, the guy, is it, he's one of the richest men in the world, lives in Spain. This guy is absolutely incredible. This is an old family business that was in retail and, and, and clothing for a very, very long time. And then one of their brands he created was Zara. And Zara had this model, which was, you know, you have all this fashion, right? You've got like the, these beautiful couture shows. You've got New York Fashion Week and Paris Fashion Week. And like that sort of sets the stage for what is coming out in fall or spring. And it's always a season or so ahead, right? And you know, this year blue is in, or green is in, or short skirts are in, or long skirts, or you know, big lapels, small lapels. These fashion shows set the stage, and then all of the retailers in the world run around trying to figure out what they're going to order based on what the trends are gonna be, and then they just buy tons of stuff, which is why places like Marshalls and other places like that exist because the buyers at Macy's and Blooming, uh, Bloomingdale's and all the others, they overbought. They bought too many fluorescent pink sweaters. Right? They bought too many Paisley ties, and now Paisley ties are out, 
where they bought too many spring skirts and now the season's changed. So then they have to have a secondary market to get it to, right? So think about this. That business model for the Marshalls and the TJXs of the world, it's pretty cool. Like, they don't need buyers. <laughs> they, don't, they don't need to send people to fashion shows and see what the trends are and then negotiate. They basically are the secondary market for the ones that already did that. Whereas the Macy's and the Bloomingdale's and all of them, the Neiman's, they, they're sending people around the world to figure out what the trends are, then figure out who they're gonna buy from to make those trends, right? So it's a, it's a food chain, right? People in Marshalls are not trying to sell $1,800 skirts, but the people in Neiman Marcus are. But they're all in that same value chain. Zara said, well, this is kind of crazy. You shouldn't have to pay couture prices in order to have style or wait for it to show up in Marshalls. So what they've done is they had this phenomenal model. They essentially created super fast manufacturing of clothing um, facilities, and they would send their people to the fashion shows. All of that is digital photography. Whatever the trends were, they were literally able to make it that week. So if their people decided that this week we absolutely see a trend in this particular area, they're able to make it. And I think for those of you that shop at Zara, you know, you can walk into a Zara today and you'll see a pair of, you know, beautiful pants and a blouse and a, and, a, and a jacket over. It is not there in five days, eight days. So they sell, they send very small amounts to their stores and that's it. So they cut inventory, which is the biggest headache of the Macy's and the Bloomingdale's and all the other ones. They stayed cutting edge fashion because they're essentially copying what's coming off the runway. But they kept the price point at sort of the Macy's, Marshall's sort of price point. I mean, another way of thinking about a business model is actually disrupting two or three at the same time. So they're one of the great case studies out there, and, and uh, I like them a lot. Ikea, they're just mind-boggling. I'm scared. If you walk into an Ikea, you get lost. It's bigger than a Home Depot. Um, so I'll sort of summarize on a few things. One, keep your message simple when you're telling your story about your company. What's the story? Create urgency, create vision. We're doing something special. It's going to be big. You want to be on the ride. Who's part of our team? The leadership. These people know the industry sector. They know the space. They can innovate. And then get things done. Think about execution. Always changing, always modifying your plan. And then ultimately, your business model needs to include these key pieces. And I'll close there. These slides will be available to everybody uh, if you'd like to see them again. And, uh, I'll leave it open for any questions that you might have. Great, thank you all for your time. Great. Yep. That'd be great, okay, sure. So I heard the first part of it. Go ahead, repeat that. Two things. One is, I'll answer this one. I'll do it in reverse of what I thought. So um, obviously you're not a fan of 23andMe uh, because his question was sort of around groups like 23andMe who are abusing and using people's data, their lack of knowledge around genetics, their lack of knowledge around science, and how that correlates to sort of ethical business models. Is that correct? Okay. So I, I would say, I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily agree that they're using and abusing. Um, I think that uh, they're selling to adults, right? So this is not something that's targeting 14-year-olds. Um, they are selling with very detailed permissioning, right? Patient awareness or customer awareness, letting them know whether this is gonna be used in later stage trials or not, et cetera. Um, but I don't know enough about uh, their, their exact sort of consumer corporate sort of sharing of data to, to say where they really potentially used or abused. But, on the face of it, I think your question is a great one, which is um, I think companies need to, in general, take these things into consideration, especially in this environment, 
where we live in a, in a world where you know, transparency is almost a requirement before you do anything, right? All of us sign up to websites, we click yes, accept, remember me, all of these type of things. I mean, at some level, the, the onus is on us to read that small print. And if you don't, essentially, they might be using your data, your information, for something other uh, than what you had hoped. Uh, I mean, you think about organizations like Facebook, you think about organizations like Tinder, you think about these type that have personal information, photographs, they know your history, you might have checked in on a spot. You know, so when you delete that account, does that information really go away? And I do think that the onus is on us as consumers to be smart enough to read that, but there's also a tremendous onus on those companies to be transparent and honest. And if your business model is based on doing this and this on the surface, when in actuality, what you're really doing is you're collecting a whole bunch of scary data here that might be used for other reasons, uh, that to me really is very concerning. And, I, and I, I know as an investor, but I know a lot of investors who would just look at that and just say, yeah, no. Uh, you know, I see what you guys are doing, I see how you're gonna get to here, but if your goal is to actually collect this information, as an example, information collection, but you really have another purpose, you either disclose that now or we're not investing, right? Because we totally get that in order for you to achieve your goal, you have to collect a big enough N to, to have a meaningful number. Uh, but I do think that it's really important as companies think about um, how they sell their products. Uh, moving away from even the consumer space, I mean, companies selling business to business uh, have these same issues, right? I mean, you have a, you have a lot of companies out there that, that their business model might be, we're gonna sell as many of these things or these things as possible, but maybe they're not disclosing to their client that inside of here is a device that's collecting information on how often they use that device or you know, what are they actually streaming through that device. So I think it's really important for the companies to say, no, 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 yes, we're gonna give this to you to use, but also be aware we're collecting this information. Uh, because I think we've all learned that you know, uh, companies can actually give things away if they have enough funding. That allows them to increase their, their overall user base, uh, but they might actually be looking to achieve something more than just revenue. They might be looking for data that they then can resell into the market. And I think all of us have been victim of that for years, right? You sign up for some new magazine or some credit card or some newsletter, and all of a sudden your, your junk mailbox is getting pinged with a whole bunch of things. That to me is, it's highly unethical. Like that company did not tell me that just because I was signing up to download the CB Insights report that they were gonna then sell my name to 80 other people that were paying them a, you know, four cents a name, right? So I, I, it's a great question. And I think it really should be considered uh, as a business. And you need to be prepared to answer those questions as well. Um, it's, it, it, a lot of investors are asking that. Um, other questions? Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I mean, certainly it has a huge impact on, on lots of industries that it didn't before, right? The tech industry was pretty much you know, regulation free. I mean, the only thing you saw in the tech industry 10 or 15 years ago was anti-competition. You know, Microsoft was becoming a conglomerate or, or, or just a, a, a force that was uh, hindering competition. So then the regulators went after them. And that was pretty harmless, right? It was basically Microsoft got a big ass fine, Bill Gates negotiated that away, or parts of it. Now it's a whole different ballgame, right? Because what you're seeing is tech companies impacting consumers, and that's where it really starts to hurt, right? Nobody really cares if Intel made a bad buying decision, right? <laughs> so no one cares if, you know, down the street, if, if Gillette bought a whole bunch of mediocre computer servers and got screwed. Like, that's up to Gillette to deal with that company and they can sue them and there's a course. But if that company is selling to consumers who are potentially impacted and damaged by that, regulation has, has a really important role. Um, 
But I kind of sit on both sides of the fence on the regulation piece because it's different than the ethics piece, right? Which is that governments are not innovative, okay? Very few. And you can probably count on one hand the most innovative governments in the world, and Singapore would definitely be at the very, very top of that. But governments are not known for innovation. They're not pushing the envelope on new change. They typically stifle innovation. So that's why companies like Uber wind up doing so well in the beginning, and then they're faced with regulatory challenges, right? That's why Airbnb, so well in the beginning, boom, the regulators come in. You know? Same thing in the financial services industry. Um, where the regulators then step in. I mean, if you look at what's happened in, uh, specifically in the fintech space around um, cryptocurrency, I mean, that was a completely a wild west. Like, the regulators didn't know what the hell to do with it. Like, they just thought this was completely fake. They thought it was just magic powder that was being thrown around by companies. But then all of a sudden, these guys started doing these, <laughs> these, these IPOs, right? with cryptocurrencies and other things. And the regulators at that point stepped in and started saying, wait a minute, we know we can't regulate you like a bank or like a currency, but we're also not just gonna treat you like a tech company because consumers are impacted. They're buying that Bitcoin or that other currency, and there's many of them out there, Bitcoin's just the poster child. They're buying that now, and that may or may not have real value. So you know, I think there's always a balance. This is typically where like, amazing CEOs and others come in Right? It's usually the founding CEO moves into some other role and they hire somebody that's kind of played ball at that level. Um, or they have a board and, and lawyers that can play ball. I mean, 23andMe would not have survived had they not probably had the best lawyers in the world. And, and Anne survived not only as the founding CEO, but all the way through that. Uh, most companies don't. But regulation plays an important piece. I, I don't think it's a big concern in the early days for startups, unless you're in a highly regulated industry like telecommunications or medicine. Uh, or finance, um, but be prepared. If you become a market player, you're gonna wind up having to fight with some government that wants more money out of you or stricter regulations and so forth. There's something to think about. Yeah, so the first part of your question I, I think is great because uh, it's easy to answer, which is you have to pick one, right? You, you, can't, you can't go to an investor or try to convince your team, we're gonna go three different business models, right? No, 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 you have, you have to have the guts to say, listen, we're gonna do this, right? I believe this is the path to go, this is the data, this is what our competitors are doing, we understand them, we're gonna go that one way. Um, the, the other part of it is like, what equals success before you actually say, oh, now we have to change our business model? That is really hard to answer because that is so company specific. So remember our discussion around how important it is to measure things and what you're measuring better be important and related to your business model. So if you decided like, listen, the way we're gonna be selling the software is downloads, 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 and we're gonna blanket that market we're targeting with ads and we should be at X amount of downloads, like those are the measurements, right? If that starts to fail, then you need to know, like, we're not hitting our numbers. Is that okay? Do we just over-speculate? Or were we basically just not succeeding? And then you need to make the shift. For some companies, like, there's no way to know that until you literally have invested a lot of money in one particular path, right? Because companies make that decision every day. Like, hey, we've got $3 million to spend on marketing. Do we put it into ads? Do we target our, you know, potential customer base? Or do we buy trade show space at... Uh, you know, the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas, right? You have to choose whichever path you're gonna go down, and then each company is different when you're gonna ultimately iterate. Um, and that's, but I, I will say, these are not decisions made in a vacuum, right? So you're making it with your team, you're making it with your board of directors who are advisors and investors. Hopefully they have insights into the market as well. So hopefully you're not making that alone. Go ahead. Uh, without a question, yeah. I, I think that, uh, 
you know, when you take a look at some of the companies out there that have failed, you know, like the 2019 failures, you know, WeWork is definitely one of those question marks that hasn't failed, uh, but it's certainly the jury is out. And I think that, that Wall Street and the investment community have clearly recognized that what, what that CEO and that team were doing is they were measuring success based on number of locations, number of startups, you know, blah, 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 number of leases signed, that kind of thing. When in actuality, perhaps that wasn't the right measurement, right? So you saw there was something in, a, I don't know, it was the Wall Street Journal, the FT, just a couple weeks ago that they signed something like four new leases this past quarter, which is like one-tenth of the amount they, they had signed in prior quarters. Um, because all of a sudden now, people are looking at it going, wait a minute, let me get this straight. You guys actually don't own anything, right? You, you basically go to big buildings and you say, okay, listen, we're gonna take 10,000 square feet and they sign a five-year lease which could be, you know, total value of that lease could be 25 million, 50 million, 100 million over that period of time. You're gonna stuff it with a whole bunch of startups. What no one was thinking about with WeWork is like, well, so a majority of your revenues coming from startups that are venture funded, when those companies stop getting funding, what's the first thing they stop paying? The rent, right? They have staff to pay, they have cell phones to keep turned on, they have airfare to pay for to get to that next conference to give them one more breath of life to meet with one more investor, they stop paying the rent. And you have to go through a whole process of getting them out. So I think the investors started to realize, wait a minute, this is kind of crazy. Like you guys have billions of dollars in leases and your biggest tenants are very often little tiny companies with seven people and five million of funding in the bank, right? So that, that was something that was like a big wake up call. Um, so I hope that answered that part of the question. I, I think just my personal opinion is that many of these companies are just so ridiculously overvalued. It, it's, it defies logic. It's almost like the dot com bubble happening again. And, and part of that is uh, driven by density of capital. Um, one of the reasons we invest in Europe is because there's not a density of capital. We can wind up investing in a company in London, Spain, Portugal, Lithuania, that has phenomenal people out of top universities, X amount in revenue, blah, blah, blah. And, and we can invest in those companies at one third or one half of the same exact company sitting in Kendall Square. And you know what? They're sitting in Madrid and they're paying $2,200 a month for rent. That same office space in Kendall Square or the Seaport or San Francisco or New York will be 8,500 a month. Their CEO sitting in Madrid is getting paid 125 a year. The same CEO is getting paid 375 a year in New York. So it's like the scale, the valuations are lower and also the cost to run the companies are lower. And people are like, wow, how could that be? It's like, well, think about it. It's like real estate. You know, why is it that Beacon Hill or Back Bay real estate is X amount you know, per square foot, but if you go 20 miles outside of Boston, you can buy an entire house for that, right? So it's, it's density of capital, right? New York phenomenal real estate market. Why is that? Well, because if you want to live on the Upper West Side, there's a billionaire standing right behind you ready to put an offer on that property that just went up for sale. So that's what you see in Silicon Valley and many other areas where you've got one super hot startup and you've got six VCs chasing it. Very easy for them to raise $20, 30000000 million. And to a VC sitting on a billion dollars or more, does it really matter to them whether the pre-money valuation at investment is 25 million or 30? <laughs> it's like, it's a total rounding error, who cares? Yeah, we'll give you your $30 million valuation, but you're gonna take our term sheet, not Kleiner Perkins. Okay, right? It's a rounding error for them, because it's all funny money at that point. So the density of capital does drive a valuation, so that's a big impact. You know, as an investor and as entrepreneurs, you have to think about, you know? And if you're joining a company that's raised capital, you have to think like, have a hard discussion with that CEO. Like, so you guys raised capital last year. When are you gonna be out of capital? When are you gonna be raising capital again and are your existing investors gonna participate? It's got nothing to do with the business model at that point. It's just sheer keeping the lights on, right? So great question because there's so many dynamics around that. I think I, I'm four minutes over my time. Uh, maybe one more question if there is one. If not, I'm gonna turn it over to Joe and our next speaker. Yes, all right, one.
your product is a lot harder, so I was wondering if you had any opinion about that. I don't. I mean, we don't really invest in consumer products, quite frankly. I know a lot of models, but uh, you're right. It's a totally different model. Um, you know, investing in the next Uber, the next app uh, that's going to be on the App Store, or I should say running those kind of companies, it's an entirely different metric. You're right. Um, and I, I do think from a business model perspective, really simply, it's like you have to pick one. Uh, because you see a lot of companies, you know, uh, that they want to be a Dropbox who sells to governments, corporations, and people. Like, don't come out of the gate like that. Like, just pick where you think you can win and just go kill it and absolutely win in that space. And then you can say, okay, now we're ready. We're going to start to go to medium-sized business. We're going to go to the next level. Uh, but the bigger the business, the harder it is to sell to. Do they have procurement and decision-making and all, all that other nightmare? Um, so... Uh, Great question, and I want to thank you all again for your time, and best of luck with this class. Thank you. Thanks, Joe.